Well, it, uh, it may not be obvious, but um, I abandoned perfection some time ago. <laughs> I'm disturbed you find that so funny. <laughs> but fortunately, in the pursuit of devices and our urge to constantly miniaturize technology, we've given the world fantastic opportunities in communication, in lighting, computation, and even enabled new tools to explore nature at unprecedented length scale. And we've been hearing a lot about them today, from the atomic scale to the galactic scale and even beyond. And much, if not all, of this technology has been based on the fact that we're quite good at shuttling electron charges, that is, the charges of the electron, around materials to store bits of information. And these materials have to be pretty pure, pure enough that we can generate them in the lab and pure enough that there are really very, very few defects. And we've gotten quite adept at this. We can make bools of single crystals, such as silicon shown here, with remarkably few flaws. And we can slice them, we can dice them, we can craft them into devices at the micron scale and even below. And we need to do this in very clean environments to keep the dirt, the debris, the impurities off of these devices. We even shield ourselves by putting ourselves in suits with the devices that we carry. So it's a major process, and it's raised some interesting problems. The first, of course, is financial. Every time we want to go to a smaller scale of technology, it's an enormous investment, now actually encroaching well over $5 billion to build a new fab plant. So it's limiting the number of times we can really do this. It's a serious cost. Yet we've been very fortunate. All of this technology has been built around silicon, arguably one of the most abundant elements on the planet. There's a lot of it. But there are other pains that we suffer in this process. And Bob Keyes at IBM, in the mid-80s, actually gave us some interesting clues about this, where he plotted the number of atoms used to store a bit of information as a function of the decade. And interestingly enough, when we plotted our storage technologies, they followed along this disturbing line. And actually, we're right on progress, according to his predictions. If I've uh, plotted the feature size here of a Pentium 4 chip, and those of you that own terabyte hard drives have devices with about 100,000 atoms or so storing a bit of information right around that point around 2010. So uh, can this miniaturization just simply continue? Can we actually build storage systems at the level of a few atoms? That seems problematic just based on the laws of thermodynamics. Maybe it's possible. It seems like a problem. The other issue, of course, is environmental. What do we do with these older machines? As we constantly like to buy our new iPhones and our new technologies, how do we discard the old ones? And what's the impact on the environment? And maybe a more overarching question with all of this is, is this really the right path for us? Do we just want to make smaller devices, faster machines? Will this let us solve some of the most pressing problems we need to solve? Is it even worth continuing down this track? And I think that's not obvious. Well, besides silicon, there's another element around us that's pretty prevalent, and it's carbon. And carbon forms a wonderful substance, diamond. And uh, in a way, sort of similar to silicon, we've gotten pretty good at processing carbon and processing diamond. We've dug some of the biggest holes in the world to grab it. Some of them over a kilometer in diameter, about half a kilometer deep. And a diamond's a very interesting material. It's a semiconductor. It's transparent. It's incredibly strong. Uh, it's very interesting, but uh, somehow it hasn't made our way into technology. So why is that? Why don't we have diamond technology? Someone. Exactly. It's expensive. <laughs> so. How many of you have purchased a diamond? You know, I can't see anything, so you have to scream. How many of you purchased a diamond? OK, well, I'm gathering a lot of you haven't purchased a diamond. And the good news, for those of you who haven't, is that now, like silicon, you can grow nearly flawless, perfect, single crystal diamond in the lab out of methane. And for those of you who have purchased a diamond, well, it's the moment, really, isn't it? So people have been predicting this for some time, and science fiction authors, perhaps more than others, have been predicting maybe we'll move from the Silicon Age to the Diamond Age. And here in Wired, they had a wonderful prediction many years ago, $5 a carat, flawless, made in the lab. And here we are. That's the case. So why is this interesting? Well, as you just heard in the previous talk, and I'm sure several of you are aware, you know, it's been fantastic to live in the Silicon Age. We're given a system where we move electrons between gates and devices, like the transistors that Charlie just showed us. The electrons are there, they're not there. It's a one, it's a zero. It's binary logic, it's been immensely powerful. 
You generate heat when you move these electrons around, but the success is inarguable. But in addition to mass and charge, as we've been hearing, there's another particle property of these electrons, and that's spin. And much like the Earth spins on its axis, the electron has a spin that acts like a tiny bar magnet. And this bar magnet, as we heard, doesn't just point up or down, it's a quantum mechanical variable, so it can exist in this bizarre superposition of states. It can be both up and down. And we just saw some wonderful demonstrations, and even we learned more about prime numbers um, in the previous talk. <laughs> That's the takeaway message. So what about diamond? Well, diamond has some defects, like silicon, like other materials, but maybe to solve some of our technology issues, we need to think a little differently. Maybe what we need to do is not use our immense technology to remove the defects from material. Maybe what we need to do is think, well, maybe defects aren't so bad. Maybe we should embrace these defects and use that as a basis for quantum machines. Just think a little differently. And think, well, maybe these materials are like all of us. It's the defects that make us interesting. Some of us perhaps more interesting than others. <laughs> I have to believe that. So, <laughs> thank you. If we look around at natural diamonds in the world and we go into the lattice, we find it's made of carbon atoms, as you can see in this animation. And there'll be some impurity atoms shown in red here, and nitrogen is a natural impurity in diamond. And if we look, we'll find some missing carbon atoms, a defect. This nitrogen atom has come in, it's knocked out a uh, carbon atom, and the amazing thing that nature has done for us, this defect and this nitrogen atom conspire to create an enormous trap for an electron. It sticks there. It sticks there and it interacts with the diamond in such a way that light of a very specific wavelength can interrogate that spin with incredibly high fidelity. You can read the spin, you can prepare the spin one electron at a time. You can shine light, you can move the spin, or more conventionally, you might bring in a little local magnetic field, just like that, and whip the spin around as the field gets larger and larger. And oddly enough, all of this works at room temperature. So now we have a semiconductor single crystal, quantum mechanically active, that we can address on the desktop. So what does that mean? It means that uh, if you take and grow a beautiful single crystal of diamond, and uh, you do what my graduate students love to do, you systematically destroy it, you take nitrogen atoms and you shoot them in, and you destroy this perfect diamond into an array like this, which is about thousands of defects, and there's a little nitrogen atom near every missing carbon one, an amazing thing happens. The electron does stick where it's supposed to, and uh, you can probe it with just a microscope objective on the desktop, but an experiment is about this big. Quite remarkable, and then a surprise happens. Not only can you see this electron spin, one electron at a time in its quantum state, but you can swap the information between that electron spin and the spin of the nitrogen atom. And nitrogen has a spin buried in the subatomic core in the nucleus. So you've built at the same time a nuclear memory, if you like, a simple nuclear device where you can store information with arbitrarily large volume in the core of a single atom at room temperature in a semiconductor that you can grow in the lab. So a lot has happened in the last few years and it's made us rethink maybe defects aren't so bad. And because light is a way to do this, you could think about wiring these spins together with photons, not electronic states, perhaps mitigate the heating problems in today's technology and build photonic quantum mechanical circuits. So what would happen if you could build quantum machines? So um, I personally believe there will be quantum machines. I think their impact isn't obvious, but one thing that's clear, it will push fundamental science. As we heard about quantum simulators today, we could simulate things like quantum gravity. Perhaps we could finally map the human brain, take the 100 million neurons and understand how we manipulate and store information, something that right now is an enormous challenge. We could design new materials by solving molecular dynamics from the ground up, targeted pharmaceuticals, targeted drugs. I know many of you at Caltech are interested in that. You could redefine it. <laughs> and Santa Barbara. <laughs> you could redefine information. What does it even mean? What does information mean when you can store arbitrarily large amounts of it? And of course, none of this will happen without training a new generation of real quantum engineers. Engineers really versed in quantum science. So at the end of the day, I think Feynman was quite right as he urged us to stare down, looking below, looking at circuits smaller than bacteria, smaller than transistors, atomic scale quantum information processors that could harness enormous computational abilities. And I think today, standing on the shoulders of a giant, we continue to look downwards, trying to see the future. Thank you.